um, for those of you comparatively unfamiliar with the format, um, we will do some combination of talking and letting Gerald talk about his compositions and these stories and or process behind them, and we will also open it up to questions. But uh, um, I'm gonna pass the baton to you, if you don't mind, to talk about that tune and put it in whatever context you'd like to. Sure. Uh, first of all, hello, everybody. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Really nice to see you all here. That first song we started with is entitled Praise the Lord. And uh, I am from Detroit, Michigan, that is, <laughs> not Minnesota. Um, and uh, we Detroiters joke that you know, on every other block is a church, a liquor store, or a beauty salon. <laughs> <laughs> and it's almost true. But, you know, before I was coming, I decided to look up and actually see how many churches are in Detroit. Well, I didn't find out how many churches are in Detroit, but I found out that Detroit per square mile has the most churches of any other city in the country. <laughs> so, you, you, you know, I guess, you know, some God-fearing people <laughs> in Detroit. So, and, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I love the feeling of uh, a march, you know, like a blues that, 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 that you put a backbeat to, you know a la Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers, that kind of feeling. So that's, that song is uh, very much inspired by, by Art Blakey's Jazz Messengers and, and that feeling. And uh, I, I just uh, also want to add that that song was written about whew, maybe 25 years ago or so. Uh, when I was still in uh, <coughs> still in university, and and my brother-in-law, who is also a pastor, uh, was very encouraging to me to continue to create. You know, like he didn't ask me to you know do something that was outside of my realm. He said, "Well, just you know, God likes all." kinds of stuff. So just do what you do best. And so that's how Praise the Lord came about, you know, as 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 sort of a, a double tribute, you know, like to my to my brother in law pastor who who was very encouraging and I wouldn't be here without him because he you know, as you might know, a lot a lot of church people will be like, Oh, this is the devil's music. <laughs> so he, he was the exact opposite. So it's dedicated to Heyman Cross Jr. and to Art Blakey. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to just jump in at any point in time during our play. Our play. Except for when we're, not, when we're playing, you cannot ask. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they can, we just probably won't hear them. <laughs> Or, or we would respond to them very abstractly. <laughs> um, so do we have any questions up front? The, 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 the vibe is people tend to be shy up front. And then, uh, and then How many times have you guys all played that particular song together? Was that it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and we played it once uh, an hour ago. OK. Um, this is number two. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, well, we've all, uh, the, the three of us on this side of the, uh, it's not really a stage, I guess, so on this side of, this side of the room, this corner of the room, uh, have enjoyed digging into Gerald's music uh, over the last couple weeks, and so it's, uh, we, we don't want to give the impression that we never saw it before just now. Um, that does happen. But, yeah. Um, yes, Noah. I, I, Goes, goes back to when there was someone time when Sanaa was here. Um, do you do you write the do you come do you play another instrument? Like you compose the musical side to it as well as the. Uh, I composed all of this stuff at the piano, even though I'm not a pianist proper. Right. I can just I can do ear arrangement music. piano. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just the ear for the music. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Great. Well, it's, oh, yes. Uh, you mentioned Art Blakely and the Jazz Messengers, which I have uh, several CDs by from another percussionist as well. He offered me to uh, listen to that. But just when you said Art Blakely and Jazz Messengers, yes, you got it. You got a hold of it. You got a hold of that feeling. I also hear a little New Orleans style, just a bit in there. Even though you're from Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> but with Art Blakely and the Jazz Messenger and stuff, they had that little kind of swing in there too. And I noticed that you had that little swing in there. Yeah. Well, thanks. I'll, 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 I'll accept New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> Right well, I'm, I'm itching to play this next one, so there'll be more opportunity for questions, but do you want to set this one up, Joe? Yeah, uh, the next song we're going to play is From a Life of the Same Name. <clears throat> and uh, just to give you a little bit of background on that, I have been living in New York since 2002. Uh, and uh, all of a sudden, you know, 17 years has gone by without, I'm mean, like, where did, where did it go? I mean, I'm sure you all can relate on some level. So again, a lot of this music was written pre-New York. So this is one actually that was written in 2006 when I was still, when I was in New York, but it was written sort of as a reflection on the, the first, the, 30 years of my life. And that's why I called it From a Life of the Same Name. And it's sort of a balladish song.
Have we any more questions at this time? Yes. Uh, being a percussion man, how do you come up with all the, uh, the pots on the piano, all the strings? Yeah, well, uh, uh, ever since I was a kid, I was drawn to the piano, even though uh, I never formally learned piano. <clears throat> One kind of funny story, uh, one of my earliest memories uh, involves my dad and a piano. All right, so all my brothers and sisters uh, were required to take piano lessons, right? And they all hated it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the last, I'm the baby. So one of my earliest memories is my dad chopping up the piano <laughs> in the backyard to put out for, you know, rubbish. And uh, I wish he had not done that. <laughs> because maybe I would have actually learned. But uh, uh, yeah, to answer your question, just from, from years of fooling around at the piano and then I, I'll hear something song and that's honestly how it goes for me I, I I don't have any like formal training in composition or anything it just I'm, I'm trying to put down on paper what I what I hear that's basically it yes a quick question thinking of composition if that song represented your life up to this point what did the recurring triplet theme represent? Was it anything other than composition? Oh, well, it's interesting you mentioned that, the tri recurring triplet theme. It actually was inspired by... Um, Sorry, in case people don't know what a triplet is. Yeah. And can you play the sus? Mm. So that came out of, uh, you know, my, my favorite uh, jazz musician of all time is Miles Davis. And my, my second favorite musician is Wayne Shorter. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was inspired by a song, not written by Wayne or by Miles, but by Herbie Hancock named mm -hmm. Little One on the, on the record ESP. And, 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 it's, and it has sort of that same kind of feeling, you know, not in, not in three, not a triplet thing, but that sus sound, sus chord sound. Which, which, which kind of, to me, it, it, it evokes, like when I hear chords, different chords, I guess for all of us, it just evokes a certain kind of feeling, mm -hmm. you know, and that gives me a, a certain kind of like, the feeling of a certain type of awareness, that, that's as close as I can come to uh, describing what that, what, what that sus sound feels like to me, like possibilities, like doors are open, right. sort of. And that's that's exactly where that came from. Mm -hmm. Little one, Herbie Hancock kind of song. Yeah. Thank you. And to be clear, if you're new to this, you don't have to know what a sus chord is or a triplet or anything to ask questions. So, <laughs> um, could be, uh, but um, I want to cajole anyone. Does anyone else have a question at this time? If you don't have to this one, you probably will have to do the next one. <laughs> so maybe we, maybe we segue uh, right into it. Yeah. OK, this next song uh, comes from a record uh, entitled uh, Be It As I See It from a band uh, called Uncle June. And uh, Southerners um, often call their, their their junior kids, June. Have you ever heard that? Yes. You know, like June boy, mm -hmm. whatever. So my uncle, I mean, my dad is Uncle June because he's a he's John Henry Cleaver Jr. And the band is dedicated to him. And uh, the and and that you know, speaking of storytelling, that record is exactly that. It's about storytelling, 
and more specifically it's about <clears throat> my musical um, take on my ancestors uh, taking part in the great migration you know like my great grandparents my I mean my grandparents coming up from uh, Mississippi you know bringing them bringing the family to Detroit so he could work at Ford Motor Company. And, uh, you know, that's the story of million, millions on top of millions uh, of African Americans coming up uh, to, the, to the north. So this, this next song is called He Said, which has text to it, but uh, you, you don't necessarily even have to know the text, but really the idea of it is you know, the, the idea of say sitting on the, <laughs> on on the front porch of your grandparents' house somewhere down south, or whatever, and your grandfather starts to tell you this amazing story that you'll never forget for the rest of your life. So that's that's what he said is about. He said. <laughs> Measure of five and three measures of three. Three measures of three. Yeah, this is the one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Well, so I actually, I guess I have a follow up question yes. uh, to that. When you were writing uh, stuff, as the next tune will demonstrate as well, that uh, is not 
consistently within a single time signature, are you thinking about those time signature changes? Or are you just hearing phrases and then going back after the fact and deciding how you're going to notate it? Yeah, the latter. I hear the phrase first and then I figure out what it specifically is. Yeah. Cool. Um, yes. I just like the, uh, the saxophone part on the sound of the little air dolphinish. I like that. Eric Dolphy is our friend. <laughs> we shot Little Share of Brent because he's not been around since 1960. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, he's symbolic, he very much. Um, so I guess I got tons of questions. So uh, I'm going to keep about that. Uh, um, I guess this is sort of this is a leading question in a way, or a loaded question, but um, one of the reasons why I cited Gerald up front as one of the most versatile musicians around is that he defies stereotypes about how people who play stuff that's really accessible and uh, inside, so to speak, uh, are thought to be um, apt to keep more avant-garde music or experimental or dissonant music at arm's length and vice versa. There's, there's this sort of imagined, not 100% not of the time untrue, but largely imagined um, divide between people who like to play, to use jazz terminology, inside, which is to say stuff that's more um, expected within older traditions, you might say, and, uh, uh, and stuff that's more outside stuff that's more experimental and or contains um, passages that might not be background music at your uh, cocktail party. Uh, and if it is, I'd invite me because that sounds like a really interesting cocktail party like I played that last year. Um, I'll skip the cocktails, but I'll, but I'll enjoy the party. Um, um, so all of which is a roundabout setup for how do you view how do you view that continuum of sort of inside to outside music within your own voice as a player and as a, as a composer since you participate so much in everything on that spectrum? Yeah, well, I have the great fortune to have grown up with a jazz drumming dad. So the music was heard from the womb for me. Uh, I feel very fortunate in regard to that <clears throat> and um, and in growing up um, you know like meeting all my dad's friends and they were just like you know oh that's so and so oh, it's like uncle this you know like all you know Detroit jazz people and um, <coughs> in Detroit it's 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 very affordable. And I think with, with reasonable rents and, and cheap food come a lot of, comes a lot of relief and you can sort of breathe and do what you might want to do, you know. And consequently, Detroit has like a tradition of openness, you know, where, whereas like, when I came to New York, I thought every, I thought New York was like Detroit in, in the sense of, oh, everybody's doing everything, you know, but I found out pretty quickly that it's pretty segmented, you know, like when it comes to having to make some money to pay your rent, you know, people are just like, okay, I'm going to do this and I'm going to get my money, da, 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 you know, and, and a lot of times, unfortunately, creativity sort of takes a back seat. Uh, not always. Um, so that's one consideration. Um, but back to the idea of Detroit being a sort of a creative hotbed, it's always been that and it still is for all kinds of, you know, like look at Motown, look at all, all the great rock music, the blues scene, the gospel scene, um, and, and jazz scene. On every front, there's always some kind of interesting development going on there because it's just something about place that lends itself to a, a, a sort of creative spirit. Um, a 
again, back to your, your, your question, I feel like having grown up the way I grew up, where, where everything was okay, and I should add, also add that back then, say I'm talking about like the late 70s, early 80s, radio was uh, much different than it is now, and you could find like free form radio stations, you know what I mean, that played everything, all kinds of stuff, not just one genre. And so we had those kind of stations, and I was I naturally gravitated towards those kind of stations because it was very I mean, like it was all kinds of stuff like oh wow what's that? and of course at my young age I have like everything you're experiencing everything kind of for the first time is oh wow Zappa woo you know oh, wow Eric Dolphy wow you know Parliament Funkadelic oh, wow. you know like it was you know, the same station you know so. That's what I carry with me uh, to New York, that kind of op willing to be open to hear and play in, in any kind of way. So um, I couldn't quite figure out, to be honest with you, why, what, what was the big deal? Right. You know, I just felt like, oh yeah, I, everybody, is interested in, you know, like, oh, one more story and then I'll start. Uh, like when I was in elementary school, we, you know, we're in class on, on, on recess or something, and, and, and we all start talking about bands we liked or people, musicians we liked. And this person would say, oh, Jackson 5, yeah, yeah, Tate Brown, yeah, yeah. I, it was my turn. I said, oh, yeah, Yusuf Latif. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, you know, <laughs> that was the end of that conversation. <laughs> so, so that, hopefully that answers Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be selfish and ask a follow-up question. Uh, was that, like, when you got to New York, did people try to, on either end of that sort of, imagined but perceived spectrum were people trying to pigeonhole you like was it hard to be um to to i mean because obviously since you've gotten to new york you've worked with people from the m most straight ahead hard bop musicians to so the royalty of what some would refer to as free jazz would did it take some doing to um for people to view you as open-mindedly as you viewed the music? Well, I'll say that uh, I, I came into New York from the free jazz side. Um, I played with uh, the great tenor saxophonist Charles Gale. Uh, he visited uh, Detroit and I played with him and he was super encouraging. He said, whenever you come to New York, uh, look me up and I called him up. I said, hey, Charles, I'm, I'm going to make a visit. And he said, okay, let's hook up a gig. So we, we started, that's how it started happening. I would, and then I would just visit as much as I possibly could. So nobody knew about the other side, you know. So, and once, once the free jazz guys start finding out, I mean, they're open. They're more open, generally speaking, than the I call them straight ahead people, are to free jazz, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I wouldn't say I necessarily got pigeonholed. They just, one, one camp didn't know what the other, one camp didn't know me from the other camp. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, let's, uh, um, let's play this one. Okay, so this next song is called Grimmy, and uh, we decided that Grimmy is a, a cute little gremlin, <laughs> for lack of a better description, or I can't come up with anything better, so I like it. <laughs>
Uh, where? Oh, you, okay. I thought you were pointing to somebody, so. Okay, yes, George. Uh, first comment, uh, what I really liked about it was, like, unlike a lot of free music, there was a structure to it that you really grasp onto and really appreciate. And it, uh, which brings my, my question is, how much of that was actually written down? But, but basically, there were, there, were, there were strictly written sections. <laughs> During the free sections, how were they structured? Was it just a time signature for so many bars? Were there actual uh, keys and chords, chords that were involved? Can, is that easy enough to explain or not? I can give my take, but I would rather defer to the composer. I'd rather. <laughs> <laughs> Defer to the defer. <laughs> 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 Go back and forth uh, like a uh, ping pong or whatever. Um, I'll give you a, what may seem like an oblique answer up front, and then I'll try to get more technical. Um, not unlike a real life conversation, you go in with greater or lesser degrees of structure, and uh, and it within a given conversation the capacity for that structure to loosen versus remain rigid varies depending on the situation and depending to a certain extent on the rapport among the people involved. And um, the freer the, um, the parameters are, the more, it doesn't mean, freedom doesn't necessarily mean chaos depending on, I mean, that's, that's the, the with music and to a certain extent otherwise, that's the perception is that uh, once you take away uh, barriers and guidelines, uh, it's just complete anarchy. And, mm -hmm. and that can be true. The possibility for anarchy is greater in that situation. Um, however, uh, when you've got sensitive people who are listening to each other and essentially following it's going to sound far out, following a vibe, mm -hmm. then a lot of that stuff kind of presents itself along the way, just as in a conversation. You know, you don't, you didn't enter into the conversation expecting that you were going to go to some really deep, heavy place, or that you were going to go to some really playful, far out place. Um, but if the people involved have that range of emotions and openness to go there, then any of those things could happen. So um, from my perception, there was nothing at all uh, written into the piece that governed what happened during the free sections. Uh, however, it was very much governed in the moment by us responding to one another. And from a, from a certain standpoint, responding together to the fifth member of the quartet, which was some hmm. abstract entity that was giving us the energy that we were hopefully tapping into simultaneously. Um, on a super technical level, there were things I was doing that were more harmonically specific, but it was probably more based on rhythm and texture. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. so I was playing things that if, uh, um, if one of my students in the room went back and transcribed it and gave me the piano yeah. part to look at, I might be able to zone in on five seconds of music and say, well, I guess you could say that that was a such and such kind of chord with right, this right. other color added, but I was not consciously um, yeah. going there as we were playing together. I guess what I'm curious about is how much of it was dictated in the free section or was Nothing, nothing was dictated except that the written parts were so integral to creating the vibe that okay. we were all tapping so into. Off so there was no, there was no um, specific time signatures or key signatures or chords that were um, non-negotiably premeditated. Right. Um, <laughs> um, so you know, there, was, there were maybe suggestions in there, but there was nothing there's nothing we had to obey, um, but uh, we were all obligated on a less enforceable level to obey the sound that we were all finding together, which right. didn't necessarily have, have a pre-existing structure, but it's unlikely that that same improvisation could have occurred on a different tune exactly. um, based on yeah. the vibe that we were into with that. But we, 
I will say that we played through this once in the rehearsal that we had mm -hmm. when all four of us were in the same room for the first time a couple hours ago, and it sounded pretty different. Mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot of what we just did sounded pretty different. I think mm -hmm. that says a lot about uh, your collaboration, because to me, the free sections sounded a lot like there was something dictated in the music that you were all, but you were all being cohesive with each other, not based on any particular mandate, basically. But it's yeah, well, it's not, not, any, not any mandate written into the music. Into the music and this is, right. th again, this is where I'm getting a little far out, but like, right. if you have a conversation with somebody, I mean, this is the first time that Gerald and I have ever played together, and um, though I've been listening to him on records for a long time, and uh, uh, there, Everybody in this room, I think, has had the experience, and forgive me if you've heard this analogy before, some of you've heard this analogy literally dozens of times before, so thank you. Um, but if you have a conversation with someone you've just met, um, it doesn't, there are certain things that become more refined and nuanced and um, fulfilling once you develop a long-standing relationship but probably most of that potential energy exists in that first conversation and you discover pretty quickly, oh wow, they're willing to go there with me so I'm gonna go deeper or they're not willing to go there for me so I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep it over here, yeah, how about that weather? And, uh, um, and you, you, you figure that stuff out pretty quickly and, and the rapport can happen fairly instantaneously if you have people who are um, particularly uh, open to one another and have some kind of fundamental compatibility of worldview and openness. Mm -hmm. um, I think you succeeded great in that conversation. Thanks, well, it's mostly because of this guy, but, uh, um, but we, we followed the vibe. Um, did, before I answer your question, though, I just want to see if anyone else wants to chime in on that, because I just monopolized the <laughs> 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 Yeah, yeah. If, if, if the answer is that, so, now is your last chance to debunk everything I said. So uh, uh, it's like, no, actually, that song was in the key of B flat. Did you not read the chart? Uh, like, um, it was a blues. Right. Oh wait, we were playing that. <laughs> okay. um, so we had one here and one there, and then we're going to play another. Yes, Noah. There's another question. I'm, I'm, just, I'm agreeing with, with, with what you just said. It, Thanks. It, the beauty of the Jazz and Close series, because you can like. Someone like you can get Gerald CDs or listen to Gerald, or you can get any any artist you brought and, and listen to their music, and and, and you, hearing them on record or any album you have, you, you listen to the artist. It's one thing you hear it like recorded, but then you see them live. It's not the exact same as the recording. It's totally new new one, so it's not going to be the exact same every time. That's, That's a great point. Jazz. The, the, the new and creative every time. That's a great point. And this cat throws in lots of curveballs, so, uh, <laughs> which is wonderful, which is super stimulating. That's why I'm not playing in like an 80s cover band or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you. No it's not the only reason I'm not playing in an 80s cover band, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I do like 80s music, yes. Uh, I noticed a lot of the songs you've been playing are quite short, like a minute or so. Usually songs are like three, five minutes, whatever. Is there anything to that, or just we decided to end up swinging? <laughs> yeah, they just ended up being what what they were, you know. And uh, um, well, uh, one of them, yeah, it was purposefully short. The he said one, but uh, the next one we play is going to last at least thirty-five minutes. <laughs> So the next one, can you play that melody for me? Which part? Just Dr. Rob. Oh, yeah, yeah. This will probably sound familiar to you.
Yes, I forgot. So uh, I was a public school, middle school band teacher for three years in the, er, in the early 90s, straight out of school. And uh, one day the uh, English teacher came to me and said, well, we're doing, uh, we're doing some units on, on Japan. And uh, I, I know about this one song, Sakura Cherry Blossom. Can you please introduce this to your students? And so we all learned it like that, you know, just the melody, and I told them a little bit about it. And then I sat down to write a little arrangement that I could play on piano with them, you know, super simple, like I could play some chords, that's about all I can do. And, uh, and that's how this song came about. Um, and I loved, I, I, I love that melody so much, I just wanted to frame it in a way that kind of placed it in modern jazz uh, uh, vernacular. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's Sakura. Oh yeah, you got. You want to work? You got to try. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I keep on. So let's just move that on. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. 
Just to give you a heads up, we've got one tune left, so if you do have any questions that you want to ask publicly, you can of course come up and talk to any of us individually afterwards. If you do not trip over these cables in front, um, that is the one caveat. Uh, but if anyone has any questions now, now would be a great time, the only time in fact. Yes. Uh, yes, this afternoon almost every, if not all questions, was based on technical. I would like to ask you a personal one. I would like to know, what was your experience, the first person you saw perform that he was just in awe of it? And my second question is, can you share with us the time that you felt that you felt and you said to yourself, one, that that was what you're supposed to be doing? Well, uh, that's, that's a very interesting question uh, because, <clears throat> Let's see, let me go back just a little ways. And when I graduated from high school, I was already way deep into the music, you know, like wanting to be a jazz musician, you know, at whatever, 17 years old, 18 years old. Uh, but not having a real world idea of what it might take to do that. So uh, when I turned, well, okay, I graduated and I went off to my local, school, university, in town in Detroit. And I did one semester of jazz school, of, of, of a jazz degree, and my jazz teacher gave me a D. <laughs> <laughs> because we just didn't get along. So he, he did me a favor, he didn't flunk me, but he gave me the next worst, you know. And, and it really, I mean, not just that, but it prompted sort of an existential crisis to me because number one I came to the realization that I was not Tony Williams <laughs> and I would never be Tony Williams so that depressed me and number two Detroit at, at that time was in retrospect a lot better than it was, was like say 10 years ago it's getting much better and this next tune that we play is about Detroit uh, but in the eight, in the early '80s, it looked pretty bleak, you know. And and this is pre Wynton Marcellus too, you know. So I didn't I didn't see any role models my age. So I decided, oh, I'm I'm just gonna quit playing, and I did for five years. Hmm. Um, and then I came back at age 24 to go back to school because I realized, oh, I can't not play music. Uh, but I was still hedging because I was thinking, okay, in order to play this music to the, to the highest ability, you have to move to New York. And I don't know if I can handle that. You know? So uh, fast forward just a couple years, and so now I'm a junior, <coughs> and Betty Carter comes to Ann Arbor. I went to the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Mm -hmm. Betty Carter brought her group. You know, it's always young young, uh, she would always have young bands, right? Mm -hmm. And so I heard, well, Betty Carter is just like divine, mm -hmm. you know, like can do no wrong as far as I'm concerned. She's super influential in my life. Uh, so I heard her, saw her, heard her and saw, saw her for the first time. And it just completely, I was like, okay, this is what I gotta do for the rest of my life. I saw Betty Carter. And, and on top of that, there were people my age playing the music. And so I, just, I realized, oh wow, I actually there are people out here doing this, I can do it. So that was a real turning point for me. Um, what year would that be? I've forgotten the year, but I could never forget that moment. You know, like I really, that it was a galvanizing moment. Hmm. Yeah. 
and connecting that, who were some of your drum mentors that you admired? Uh, I mean, I hear oh, I had Blackwell and stuff like that, Dialogue, Billy Higgins. Yeah, all, you know, all of, every one of the greats for sure. But the Detroit guys who were super influential, you may not know their names except for maybe one, Roy Brooks, mm -hmm. who used to play with Horace mm -hmm. Silver and a lot of other people. Uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a Detroiter who was, had a huge impact on me because he also was a, a, a really interesting kind of conceptualist. I wouldn't necessarily call him like a free, he wasn't a free jazz musician, he was just a conceptualist, like he would do all kinds of interesting types of, almost like in art installation type, multimedia things before that was like hip. Um, so Roy and another great drummer named Lawrence Williams, who Jerry Allen recorded a lot of his music. Um, then there's Pistol Allen, who was one of the original Motown drummers. The nicest guy ever, you know, just super encouraging. And then one more, Joel, George Goldsmith, the most obscure. All these guys, all Detroit guys, that uh, really have a, had a strong influence on the Detroit record, uh, who I dedicated to those four, those four people, so, yeah. But all of the other ones, too, have varying degrees of. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you contact Louis Hayes and other Detroit. Oh, sure, yeah, Louis, uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Ho hopefully a, a quickie. Sure. Um, being a composing or decomposing <laughs> drummer myself, uh, who grew up in a very uh, untrained piano household, much maybe like you, my father never took the axe to the piano. Um, composing drummers, you don't hear about that very often. When you're composing, do you come in from a tactical point of view, like a riff or, or phrases that you hear as a drummer, and then it winds up creating a mood as a result, or you start with the mood in an environment that then inspires riffs that, that fill that environment, so. Most of the time it just comes from, like I'll hear a fragment of a melody, you know, I'll take note of it, try and develop it. Uh, sometimes, like for instance, Praise the Lord, the very first song we played, that just came out all at once. I just, it just, like I started hearing the first part. And then it just kept, you know, like, I was just following my nose. It just kept going, like, and I had to hurry up and scramble and write it down so I wouldn't forget it, you know, even though it's, you know, I, re I remember this so specifically. I remember, it, I don't remember where I was often, but I remember I was in Philadelphia and it was 1988. <laughs> Strange. <laughs> but, uh, but it's just kind of all part and parcel. It's just all the, yeah. the riffs and the mood are, are together. Yeah. 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 And, and now, Nowadays, I mean, I still, I don't have a piano anymore. Um, just sitting down at the piano and just fooling around would bring a lot of ideas to the foreground. But now, now that I don't have a, an acoustic piano, I use just um, keyboard, keyboard uh, with, with like a, a, a digital audio workstation, you know, just something that can record, you know, and so now I'll do the same thing I was doing at the piano, only I can endlessly record and then I can go back and check out what I did before and cobble together things. That's how it happens most of the time for me now. Yes? Any of your siblings that were forced to do the piano or the musicians? <laughs> My, I have a brother who played trumpet and drums too, and my sister played drums. Hmm. Yeah, but nobody a, amateur. Nobody, nobody was foolish enough to do that. <laughs> 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 okay. So, do we have any more questions before we uh, resume our own foolishness? Uh, um, well, so thank you. Um,
I will remind you, as I said up front, we got one more tune, so it's not like pushing you out the door, but uh, remind you while we are in a moment of relative calm before the pandemonium of this next tune ensues, uh, that if you want to support Resonant, Mo Resonant Motion's work with this series, there are any number of ways you can do so. Dropping greenbacks in the punch bowl is one. Signing up for our mailing list to find out other stuff we're doing if you're not already on it. Um, and um, expressing to those who might care um, at the library and otherwise uh, how much you enjoy and are nourished by this music and conversation. All of that would be just lovely. But uh, the most important and immediate and loveliest of all would be um, showing your love for these wonderful musicians. Chris Allen on the alto saxophone. recordings and really enjoyed his playing on the more, as we were discussing before, the more outside of the music, um, and went to hear his band perform from uh, the record that uh, this is the title track for uh, in New Haven. Uh, I guess this must have been like 12, 13 years ago. And, and so, yeah, so, uh, and, uh, and in addition to absolutely loving the music, um, this tune, praise the Lord, the one we started with, and this tune has basically been stuck in my head ever since. Um, so it's like, so I guess that's in a sense a warning um, for the, the ear earworm that is to come. But uh, it, it's good. It, it's, uh, it's a good, good earworm to have. But so can you talk about this? Yeah, this this last song is called Detroit, and uh, it's 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 our anthem, you know. Um, Every, every, okay, when I left Detroit, I used to joke, I didn't leave Detroit, I escaped. <laughs> you know, because it was like, I had gotten to the point in my life, 39 years old, it was like do or die. You know, like, okay, are you going to do it or are you not going to do it? So I finally, I did it, you know, and I don't regret it. But uh, I'm happy to say Detroit is doing really well now, much, much, much better than it was like 15 years ago. And um, I'm eternally proud of my hometown and its resilience and, you know, the dynamism there, you know, like anything is possible at any particular moment if you set your mind to it. So everything that used to bother me about Detroit, now I love. You know? <laughs> so this is my love letter to my hometown, you know, Detroit. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 